Sure, we're, we're looking at our, our series here. Uh, this is the last Sunday of uh, the book of Exodus. Uh, I don't know if you're a little saddened by that. I am. Uh, this has been a great, great study, at least for me. Uh, the spiritual journey of Moses uh, leading the, the people of Israel from slavery into nationhood. And uh, the story goes on, though, but we're going to depart from that. Next Sunday, we're going to be in a new series uh, from the book of James. And James is a, is a book that talks about a faith that works. Everybody wants their faith to work. And that's what this book is about. Getting your faith to work, making it what, what, what you believe actually practice and accomplish something in life. And so we'll be uh, going in a whole new direction, jumping into the New Testament. But for our, our last Sunday here, I, I want to focus on God's dwelling with us. It's interesting. God wants to dwell with us. He does. This is mind-boggling. First of all, God is holy. In our culture, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But it means he's set apart from everyone and everything else. There is no one else like God. He is unique. We're made in his image, so we have some similarities. But none of us are God. God is unique. He's holy. He's just. He's righteous. All that is said to be, he is a consuming fire. The Bible has a term called sin. Sin means to miss the mark. Here's the mark. Be holy like God is holy. Uh, consequently, none of us are as holy as God, so we've all missed the mark. So the Bible says we're all sinners. All of us. Okay. This brings a dilemma. God, who is so holy and has a purer eyes than to look upon iniquity with any favor, how can he dwell with us? Good question. How can this all-consuming God come and dwell with us? Now, I know this from the Bible. It wasn't the children of Israel that wanted God to come and dwell with them. When given the opportunity to actually go into the presence of God, back in Exodus 19, the people said, no, Moses, it's too terrifying. The mountain was thundering, flashes of lightning were coming off of it, and the ground was shaking. And he says, come on into my presence. And they said, ah, no, Moses, you go for us. And so Moses went up. They didn't want to go into his presence. So God has decided he's going to come and dwell among this people. Well, if that was terrifying, how could this awesome, holy, terrifying God come and dwell with his people? Well, the answer is given in the chapters that follow the giving of the Ten Commandments. In the chapters that follow the giving of the Ten Commandments, God says, when we get to Exodus chapter 25, he says, you're going to build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. God said, hey, I'm going to dwell in your midst, and in order to do that, you've got to make a structure for me to come and occupy. And, and I've got a kind of a picture here of what we, reading the scriptures, uh, we get an idea of what it looked like. It's a tent. It's got a wall around a courtyard. There's a gate that faces the east. From chapters 25 all the way up to 32 that we touched on last week where Aaron made the golden calf, Moses has been up on the mountain and God is giving him a vision so that he's supposed to construct this tabernacle after this vision he's given uh, to Moses. And so Moses, when he finally comes down with the Ten Commandments, because he, God says they've already corrupted themselves making the golden calf, he throws the tablets down, smashes them, and, and Moses is going to have to go back up on the mountain. And the second time, Moses has got to write down the Ten Commandments. First time they were written with the finger of God. And this, the, after chapter 32 to the end of the, the book of Exodus, it tells us, more information about this tabernacle and actually the construction of it. So from chapter 25 to 40, it's all about this tent, a tabernacle. It's a sanctuary where God could dwell. It says, in accordance with all that I will show you concerning the pattern, it calls it a tabernacle. 
that's a tent, a temple tent. It was portable. They would take it down, move, when the camp stopped, put it back up. When, when, when the glory cloud of the Lord moved on, they followed the glory cloud. They had to take down the tent, move it, place it under the glory cloud, put it back up. It was a sanctuary. Now, since all those chapters, 25 through 40, talk about the sanctuary, I'm not going to go through all the details of it. I just want to know is, if you were to look at a blueprint looking down on the sanctuary, the tabernacle, it would face the east. That's the back doors that you came through. East. Uh, in the west was the rear of the sanctuary. Uh, to the south was the one side to the north. So it's facing east where the sun would rise. There are certain articles of furniture. There's this courtyard around the outside. There is the tent structure that two ha had two halves, the holy place and the most holy. In the courtyard, there were two articles of furniture. The one was the brazen altar. Every day, they would offer a sacrifice in the morning and the evening. You would bring a lamb, and it would be killed, its blood would be collected, and they would sprinkle the blood on the four corner posts that were called horns on the altar. Uh, depending on what kind of uh, sacrifice it was, certain portions or all of it were placed on the altar, and it was burned up. Certain ones, only part of it was burned up, the other part was taken outside the camp. You can read all about that in the book of Leviticus. But this was the brazen altar. You could never approach a holy God without an offering. You could never approach a holy God without a sacrifice. And that's what was in the way. Right behind it was the labor. And the labor was for the priests. The priests would ceremonially cleanse both themselves and they would ceremonially cleanse parts of the offering that were to be laid on the, on the altar that were to be burned. And so every day, when, when, a, when somebody brought in their offering and was slain, it was then handed over to the priest. The priest would do his ceremonial cleansings, and then they would offer it on the altar. And they would ceremonially cleanse themselves before they would ever go into the, the tabernacle itself, the holy place. Inside the holy place, there are three pieces of furniture. Uh, on uh, the south side, there is a candlestick, a lampstand. And on this lampstand, they would burn it uh, all night long. They would burn it when nobody was in there. <laughs> they would burn it. So they'd go in and they had to light it and it would burn all night. Across from it, on the north side, there was what was called a table of showbread. They would place bread before the Lord uh, on a weekly basis. The bread would be there. And they would place this bread on the table uh, before the Lord. And then just almost before you get to the curtain that divided the holy sanctuary into two halves, the holy place and the most holy place, there was an altar of incense. And the, the priest would burn incense on, on that altar and it would be a fragrant aroma that would just fill the whole place. Now then there was on, on the back side of that, that curtain that divided into two halves, there is only one article of furniture, and it is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, how many have seen Indiana Jones? And you know that they were in search of the Ark of the Covenant. And they had a pretty good depiction of what it looked like. Uh, when, when I was uh, in Rome, uh, I took a, a, a photo of the great relief on the wall where the Romans are carrying out uh, all the, the spoils from Jerusalem and, and they are carrying, it's got the relief where it has this picture of the Ark of the Covenant and, and, and the, the lampstand and those kinds of things. In any case, it's a box. It's about three feet. It's a little bit smaller than the Lord's Supper table. The lid is called the mercy seat. The lid that opens up the box and inside later uh, they will put the Ten Commandments and they will put the Aaron's rod that budded and it it continued to bloom every year. And, and then a, a pot of manna, that angel food that we've, we've read about. It would all be inside there. And on top was the lid and it was gold. Everything was overlaid with gold. And out of one piece of gold they had beaten out and, and shaped two cherubim whose wings overreached on the top. And, and some believe that's because once a year when the high priest would go into the holy sanctuary, he, he alone could only go into the presence of God because of, between the arch 
wings and the mercy seat, God dwelt. In a way, he didn't dwell anywhere in the rest of the universe. It's called the Shekinah glory of God, Shekinah, to dwell. It's the glory dwelling of God in the sanctuary, and once a year, the high priest could go into that chamber, and he would go in, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, because the law was inside the box. The law the nation had broken, and the blood would make a covering for their sins, and God's outraged holiness against the sinful people was satisfied by making that covering. Every bit of this points to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an offering that was made because the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. Jesus is our offering. He was not only the priest, but he was the offering. He offered himself a sacrifice for our sins. He is the only one who is pure enough to do this, like the laver. He is the sinless Lamb of God. He is called like the lampstand on the one side. He is the light of the world, Jesus declared. On the other side is the bread. He is the bread of life. Then you have the, the table, the little altar of incense. And we're told in the revelation that the incense are the prayers of the people. He is our high priest who prayed the high priestly prayer in John 17, and he prays for us. When you go into the most holy chamber, You've got the Ark of the Covenant, and the Bible says the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. All they could do was cover it, but the Lamb of God appeared to take away the sin of the world, so that in Hebrews it says he appeared one time to take away sin forever by the sacrifice of himself. The only way a holy God can dwell with a people is for a sacrifice to be made and for that sacrifice to satisfy the justice of God so that this God can dwell in the midst of an unholy people. That's what's going on here in the book of Exodus. Now, you get to the, book of, to the end of the book of Exodus in chapter 40. It says that after they had constructed the whole thing, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle, the glory cloud. It arrived when God's presence, the Shekinah glory of the Lord, went inside and manifested itself in the Ark of the Covenant. A cloud appeared above by day, and the text says, and that same cloud looked as if it were a pillar of fire by night. Do you realize, from the year of about mm, 1440, down all the way to somewhere in the 1580, uh, 586, 1440, almost, uh, what, 700 years, the cloud was over the tabernacle and the temple every day. Every day. Pillar of fire by night. Because the Lord was in his holy temple. The Lord was in his temple. What? He was dwelling in the midst of his people. Now, if I could take that diagram and reduce it down to the, the, the tabernacle, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit into the book of Numbers. Because in the book of Numbers, okay, it tells us that the nation Israel were to uh, actually be arranged in a certain order around the camp. And so we're getting this bird's eye view. We're looking down on the tabernacle, the sanctuary of God, and completely around it, the Levites were supposed to dwell. So all the Levites who were to take care of the tabernacle itself, that was their job as a tribe. Uh, they didn't do anything else. They just took care of the temple of God, the tabernacle, the tent. They had to camp completely around it, surround it. The priests were of the tribe of Levi, the descendants of Aaron. And they were right around it. It says then, if you read the passage here, it says, the Israelites shall camp in their respective regiment camps and companies all the way around it too. To the east, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, 186,400 is given to us in the book of Numbers. It's called the book of Numbers because it numbers everybody. The census is taken and it counts everybody. God's concerned about numbers. He's concerned about every last individual one of us, okay? And so what we have here is this census taken and it says 
there's 186,400 from these three tribes, and they are to be to the east. This is so important. He says, now then, to the, what would be the south, okay? Reuben, Simeon, Gad, 151,000. To the north, Ephraim, and Nasa, Benjamin, 108,000. And then to, uh, I mean, to, to the west, to the north, Dan, Asher, Naphtali, 157,000. 600. If, if you were in heaven looking down on your sanctuary, God, he would see the arrangement of the camps and all their tents making the shape of a cross. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And in the midst of all the shape of the cross and all the furniture laid out in the shape of the cross, in the very midst of it, God dwells with his people. God dwells in the midst of his people. I want you to say it with me, okay? God dwells in the midst of his people. God wants to dwell with you. I want to do a little fast forwarding. We're going to go down uh, from uh, the year 1440 when they set up the, the tabernacle. We're going to go down to about the year 970, somewhere around there, about the year 1000 BC. And uh, David has set up his kingdom and he's built a uh, a palace for himself. And he looks out from his palace and, and he sees the tabernacle. And David the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in the house of cedars. I got this palatial palace. But the ark of God, God's throne, the ark of the covenant, where God dwells, God stays in the tent. David says, there, this is a, There's something wrong with this picture. I have a better house than the house of the Lord. There's something wrong here. And so he says to Nathan, I want to build a temple for God. And God says that to, to, through Nathan to David, oh, your, your heart is good, but you're a man of war and you're not going to build a temple for me. But your son Solomon can build me a permanent structure because he is not a man of war. And so David starts to accumulate cedars from Lebanon, all the gold and the silver. He's getting everything. He's collecting it because he knows his son is going to build the temple. And so that's what we have next. The temple of Solomon was constructed somewhere around 970. It's, it's dedicated. And from 1 Kings chapter 8, we're at the dedication scene of, of the temple, Solomon's temple. He gives this lofty prayer of dedication to the temple. And when the priest came out of the holy place, it says, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. And you see God is entering into his temple. From a tent to a, to a, a stone structure. And he says here, so that the priest could not stand in the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And, and so I put the the glory cloud of the Lord over the temple just like it would have been in the day. Now I go down because the nation Israel became very idolatrous. They kept going after the gods of the Canaanites, Baal, Ashtoreth, and Dagon, and all of these. And, and idolatry was just ruining the nation. And God had his fill of it. And the Jews said, well, no, the God will never allow his temple to be destroyed. And Ezekiel, when we come down to the life of Ezekiel, he's carried away into captivity. And he's carried away into Babylon. And from Babylon, he's given this vision. And he sees the glory of the Lord in this vision. And it rose up from the cherubim. And it went to, the glory of the Lord went out. And it stopped at the entrance to the east. And the glory of the Lord ascended uh, from the middle of the city. And it stopped at a mountain. And it keeps going. And the glory of the Lord is gone. And there's a term for this. It's called Ichabod. The glory is departed. Ezekiel sees this vision of the glory of the Lord leaving. And not much long after that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, actually in 586 B.C., goes into Jerusalem, totally destroys the temple, totally destroys the city. He says, the captain of the bodyguard, the servant of the king of Babylon, that's Nebuchadnezzar, came and destroyed. And he burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, the house of Jerusalem, every great house he burned down. He totally destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Before doing that, they'd taken all the articles of furniture. They took the lampstand, the table of showbread. They took all the cups. They took all, all the things in the temple. And uh, 
The story goes on in, in the story of Daniel. After Nebuchadnezzar died, one of his sons uh, arose to power named Belshazzar. And King Belshazzar uh, remembered that uh, his father was having this feast of thousands. Remember that his father, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken all the, the vessels from the tabernacle, uh, from the temple. And, and he called for them, and they were all drinking out of heaven, this debauchery party with the holy vessels of God. Suddenly, the plaster on the other side of the wall from where he was sitting next to the lamps that were lighting up the place, a hand appears and starts writing in the, the plaster. Just a hand. You ever heard the expression, the handwriting's on the wall? And that's exactly where it comes from. It says he shook. His knees were knocking together. He was terrified. He asked all, this, all of his People that were in his kingdom that tried to interpret, and they said, oh, nobody can interpret what the words meant. So finally they called, the, the, the queen says, well, the queen, his mother queen says, hey, there's this man, Daniel. He can interpret it. They summon Daniel. And Daniel looks at it, and it seems to be because Hebrew reads from the right to the left, and maybe it was written going up and down. However it was written, Daniel immediately read it. He said, meeny, meeny, tickle farsi. Meeny, meeny. Your days are numbered. You're done. It's over. <laughs> Tickle. You've been weighed in the balance and you've been found lacking. Bufarsin. Your kingdom is going to be taken from you, divided from you, and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, when Daniel was saying that, the Medes and the Persians had diverted the Euphrates River and they were going under the gates. They went across the Euphrates River. They were marching into the city. They conquered the city and they killed Belshazzar that very night. Why? Because the holy, these are the holy things of God. Holy things of God. We fast forward. The temple's been destroyed in 586 B.C. 539, 535, somewhere around there in B.C. Zerubbabel is a governor and uh, he leads with Ezra a group of refugees from their land, the have been in Babylon, back to their land. About 35,000 go in the first wave of them. They get there and they start to build the temple all over again. And the text tells us in uh, like Ezra chapter 3 that when they had laid the foundation, the young generation was just cheering. The people had, had been 70 years ago, the thing had been destroyed. So now they're, they're cheering. They didn't see it. They're the, the young generation. They're excited. They're on fire for God. They're, they're, look what God is doing. And the older people are all crying and weeping. Oh, remember the good old days. This is nothing compared to what Solomon had built. And so there's this mixed noise going on. You don't know if they're happy or sad. It's called Zerubbabel's Temple. You didn't think about Zerubbabel's temple. There was no glory of the Lord in it. There was no Ark of the Covenant in it. There was not the Shekinah glory of the Lord in it. And this temple that was dedicated somewhere around 516 B.C., exactly 70 years after it had been destroyed, according to the prophecy of Jeremiah the prophet, this temple, okay, is the one that Jesus would have entered. It was no longer called Zerubbabel's temple. This temple is called Herod's temple. Because prior to Jesus' birth, Herod had begun building on um, renovating. He, he actually lengthened the esplanade, the, the courtyard on the mountaintop of Mount Zion to make it much larger. And he was doing a rebuild. He was a restructuring. It, it was a renovation. And it, in the time of Jesus... Jesus had referred to himself, uh, destroy my body in three days, I'll rise it up again and call it a temple. He says, and then the Jews said to him, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, talking about the, the renovation program. This renovation program is going to go on for almost 25 more years on this temple. It gets done just in time to be destroyed by the Roman general Titus. You know anything about this temple? There's no glory for it. The glory is not in this temple. Go with me to the Gospel of John a little bit earlier in the passage to this in John chapter 1, 14. It says, the Word, the Word is the name of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and lived among us. The Word lived among us in the Greek is the word tabernacled. 
deity was in the body of Jesus Christ. So that in Colossians 2 9, it says, In him, the fullness of deity resided bodily. God was in that baby born on Christmas morning. This is God come in the flesh. It says, And we have, it says here, He dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. There was no glory in the temple, the glory was in the baby. And that's great. It says, we have seen his glory. The glory is of the Father's only begotten Son, only Son, full of grace and truth. So it is in chapter 219 when Jesus said, hey, destroy this temple, referring to his tabernacle body, uh, that his body is just, he's God inside the human body. He says, and in three days I will rise it up. And then the Jews said, this temple has been under construction 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. You see, the glory of the Lord returned to the temple when that baby Jesus on the eighth day of his life was taken to be circumcised in the temple of God. The glory of the Lord returned to the temple. Isn't that amazing? Every time Jesus entered into the temple, the glory of the Lord returned to the temple. And they beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten Son of God. Which brings me to where I really wanted to come with all of this. Whew. A long introduction, huh? All of that is just getting up to this one point. Our bodies, our bodies, are the temple of God. This church, we call this a sanctuary. Not so, folks. Right here. All right, give me, right here. <laughs> right here. This is the temple of God. And you can do the same. Pop your butt. In the door. You're, we, he says, do you not know you are God's temple. This building is an edifice. This building is not the temple of God. Well, it is today because guess what? We are here. God wants to dwell with us. Listen, do you not know that you're, you're, you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Eight years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. That moment where I placed genuine faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit invaded my body, and the Spirit of Christ dwells in me. Romans 8 says, if I have not the Spirit of Christ, I do not belong to Him. So if I belong to Him, I have the Spirit of Christ. Because that's the way it is. My body is the temple in the age in which I live. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in me. He dwells in you, if you know him. That's what he's saying. That's what he said. If anyone destroys God's temple, like Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, God will destroy that person. That's why I gotta take care of my body. I need to clothe my body. It's a temple. I need to exercise my body so that I'm physically fit. I need to get an annual checkup with the doctor to make sure. I, I need to take the appropriate medicines and not abuse any drugs. This body is the temple of God. I've got to be careful of what I consume, what I drink, lest uh, I get drunk. Drunkenness is uh, destruction of the body, destroys the liver. I've got to be very careful what I smoke destroys the heart. I gotta be very careful of what I consume through my eyes. Destroys my inner spirit. I gotta be very, very careful. This body is the temple of God. The person who destroys it destroys himself. He says, uh, for God's temple is holy. My body is holy. It's set apart from the person who doesn't know the Lord because God is in me. That makes it special. That makes it sacred. You are that temple. You are that temple. 
I go on just a little bit further. It says, do you not know in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? Which you are not your own. The day I accepted Jesus, I gave up my own ownership. I now belong, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I don't get to call the shots anymore. This temple is his. He calls the shots. He says, for you were bought with a price. That was the price of the blood. That, I mean, that, that was the sacrifice that we just talked about. He says, therefore glorify God in your body. That is the goal. Whether I eat or drink or whatever I do, I do all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 31. My body. A day is coming when the church is going to be raptured, resurrected out of, out of this world. Uh, it tells me so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord. And there's going to be a day when all the sanctuaries, the bodies, where the spirit is, is taken out. We're gone. And now it's going to resume his dealing in a period of time that Jesus called the tribulation in Matthew 24. And guess what? There's going to be another temple in Jerusalem. Revelation 11 tells me in verse 1, Come and measure the temple of, uh, temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. The artist that pulled this together, this, this picture, uh, took a futuristic temple and put it right next to the Dome of the Rock. He said, just measure the temple. Don't, why? He says, because the court outside the temple, leave that out, for it's given over to the nations. Well, guess what's there? It's, not, it's the Dome of the Rock. It, it, that, that's a different, different thing that's there. And they will trample it over for the next 42 months, three and a half years. There is a coming tabernacle, a temple. Once our temples are gone, that's where God dwells today. There's going to be this temple in, in the entire, and it, it serves an entire purpose, which we won't go into right now. But then after that temple is, is gone, the book of Ezekiel says there's going to be a future millennial temple when the Lord himself actually returns to the earth in Jerusalem and he sets up his kingdom for a thousand years. He said, I looked and lo, the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord and I fell upon my face. God is going to enter the temple in Jerusalem again in the future, in the millennium for a thousand years Zechariah puts it this way. He who will build the temple. If you read the verse before, it's called the branch. It's a messianic promise. The branch is Messiah that is yet to come when, when he's writing this. Zechariah is. He says the branch. He will build the temple of the Lord and he will be clothed with majesty and he will sit and rule upon his throne and he will be a priest on his throne. This is beautiful. King Jesus, when he establishes his kingdom on the earth, will be king on a throne, and he's going to be priest on his throne. Uh, that couldn't happen in Old Testament times because the, the king was of the tribe of Judah, and, and the priest was of the tribe of Levi, and this person, uh, he can't be both. But because Jesus is of the tribe of Judah, and he's after the order of Melchizedek as a priest, he serves as and reigns as king and priest upon his millennial throne. I'm taking it through time, and time comes to an end. The thousand years are over. And the Bible tells us the earth that we are on will be dissolved, a new heaven and a new earth, and there will be a new Jerusalem that descends down from God out of heaven. Okay, so this is my rendering. <laughs> if you read the text, it's 15,000... 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, and it's called the New Jerusalem. It looks like gold, but it's translucent. It's uh, like jasper, and it's got walls around it. There's 12 gates, and their gates are made of great pearls, and the gates never, never are closed. It says, and I saw the temple in the city. It's the, it says, I saw no temple in the city. There's no temple in heaven, for its temple is the Lord God. God dwells for all eternity with his people. 
So what are we going to take away from all of this? What do we take away? God dwells in the midst of his people. God dwells in the midst of his people. God dwells in you and me. God dwells. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. It's kind of like what we've been saying all along. Just do right. Do what is right. Glorify God in your body. Let's pray. Father, we covered a, a, a lot of material here. Your word is so rich. But the principle is very simple. You want to dwell in us. You want to settle down and make yourself at home, but you are a holy God. We need to get the crud out so that you can feel at home within us. We do that by glorifying you in our bodies. Lord, have us have a conscience that is pricked when we put something into our body that is inappropriate. Whether through our mouths or through our eyes or through our ears, because we are in a holy vessel, the temple of the true and living God. Perhaps there's someone here who says, well, I don't really feel like God dwells in me. Lord, perhaps you don't. Maybe today they need to just pray, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Dwell in me. You will hear that prayer. I know you will, Lord. And you will answer that prayer. You will invade that person's body and be with them forever. Bless us in this way, O Lord, we pray. May we go forth to glorify you in our body. In Jesus' name, 